So for, for this session, what we're going to do is just talk about uh, these three amazing advocates and how they got involved in the HD community. So I'm not going to steal their thunder and give them and say all of the introduction, but just wanted to quickly say who I'm here with today, which on my right or on your left, next to me is Tatiana, uh, who is an HDO ambassador and also has helped begin uh, the youth support program in Brazil. And if you couldn't guess, she's, there we go. <laughs> Fun fact, she lives in Brazil, I'm kidding. <laughs> and then next to her is Mustafa, he's another HD community member. Uh, he's part of the HDO research committee, uh, postdoc in research from PhD, PhD student. Well, I was trying to, you know, make you fancy. Uh, in research, uh, is it from Pakistan? But he lives in Canada, in the cold. And then last, but certainly not least, is Aaron. And Aaron is, well, hold, hold on, hold on. I mean, she's great, but I gotta say something first. Uh, Aaron is the author of, you may have seen, it's called HD Heroes, um, but she also wrote another book about her own story prior to that. Uh, she's also a fellow HD community member and also lives in Canada, but not, you guys are not too, you're in the same city, <laughs> but you didn't know each other. Look at that. This is what HDO Congress does and connects people. <laughs> so I would love for each of you just to maybe briefly share about your relationship with HD, um, as well as you know how you decided to get involved. So maybe, Aaron, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah. Um, I didn't know about Huntington's disease in my family until I was in my early 30s and I decided to start to have a family. And that's when my parents decided to reveal the long-held family secret that they thought that HD might run in our family. Um, so within a period of eight months, I found out HD was in my family. I made the decision to go through predictive testing and I tested po gene positive for Huntington's disease. So in hindsight, that really wasn't the best way for everything to happen, because obviously it was pretty quick. Um, and after I was diagnosed, I went into a deep period of depression and really didn't understand the value of my life. And it took me a long time to learn that I have value as a person outside of HD, that HD isn't all of me, it's just a part of me. Um, but still for the first 10 years, I kept my diagnosis a secret from most people, but eventually, I just got sick of hiding it, and I decided I'm gonna write a book about it. <laughs> so despite the fact that um, my family was very secretive about the disease and nobody wanted to talk about it, um, I decided that I was gonna do something big and start sharing my story. Awesome. Uh, Mustafa? Yeah, so I have a family history of HD as well. My mom had it, she started displaying symptoms when she was around 28, and she passed away from it. Uh, when she was 40. So I was pretty young when it was all happening. Um, I was around 11 or 12 when I started noticing visible symptoms in my mother, and then she passed away when I was 18. So that's really my introduction into how I experienced HD as a kid. Um, I'm currently at risk. Um, I have not been tested. I don't think I want to. Um, yeah. And Tatiana. Hi, everyone. Yeah, um, I'm at risk for HG, and I'm from my relationship with HG um, started in a very traumatic way. When I was only seven years old, I saw one of my uncles committed suicide in my backyard. So, um, how do you explain something like that for a child? And Nobody explained anything to me, so I grew up with a lot of questions, needing 
a lot of reasons why some people in my family were so different from other families. And my dad died when I was just six months, years old, I'm just a baby. And uh, I only know some people and nobody tell me anything about the disease. I just uh, become to, to know when I'm young and I find, I decide to f find some answers. And because I'm struggling with so many things in, the, in my family. And I find, uh, I ended up find my local association in Brazil and HGYO. They provide me so many informations and support. And I decide to do something, to do something for me, to do something for some people who also, like me, was in the same situation. So I start some projects in Brazil. I became a psychologist and I start some mental health care programs for people in Brazil, totally free and online. And <laughs> thank you. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> thank you uh, to each of you for kind of sharing a little bit about how each has impacted your lives. And as, as uh, many of us know, it, it can be quite challenging to deal with it, but also to accept it as being a part of your life. Um, so maybe, you know, each of you, I'd love to hear, share about how you have maybe coped with it as well as still cope with it. Because I know each of you, you mentioned, you know, just it, it makes you feel very, uh, I would say mixed emotions, sad, maybe frustrated. Uh, just about this being a part of uh, each of your lives in some capacity. So maybe you can share about how you currently cope with it or any any kind of things that helped in the past when first learning about it. Uh, Tatiana, do you want to start us off this time? Sure. So um, I think my experience with HG and getting involved, and um, just think that like a s my life like a storybook. And this chapter in my life is, uh, is the big chapter, HG, become the big chapter. And I think um, I learned to cope this situation, think uh, like before I'm getting involved, it's almost if I, um, this chapter was written by other stories, by other people by my families, by my dad's story, by my uncles, by... But the moment, the, from the moment I decided to get involved, I learned to cope the situation and le learning... Uh, it's, it's almost I finally can write my own story for my way, for, for me, for other people, and other new things and new chapters in my life with HG. Just, no, not just the, the um, tragic, but other things, the, like here, like we learn here, like the connections we made here. So I think this, it's amazing for change, the way we cope the situation. Uh, I know HG is very complicated, and, and I think that's, that's the difference, the, the strategies, we find in, in events like this, it's so helpful for, for us and for coping the situation. Um, the way I currently cope with it is through therapy. <laughs> uh, the way I coped in the past through it was not really healthy. Like I was very cynical about my future and what I was doing. Um, so basically poured myself into my work trying to make an impact for HD families. That was my initial way of coping with it. And then as you grow older, you realize that, you know, that's not really healthy. You should get support, get the support you need for your mental health in, in a way that you can still help people, but also you, you also have to take care of yourself at times. I would say, um, well, I've been diagnosed 16 years ago now, 
So really, the first 10 years, that's scary to say it took me 10 years, um, but the first 10 years were really, really difficult, and I really didn't see the, the value in me as a person, and um, I had really low self-esteem, and I went to, through tons of therapy, <laughs> and I was, I was a support group junkie, uh, and I just um, really worked on my inner self. So a lot of people who know me just see me as the same person, but they don't see all of the inner work that I've done. And for me, making the decision to be public about my diagnosis about three or four years ago was really the best thing that I've ever done because I just felt like this weight lifted off my shoulders that I wasn't carrying around this secret anymore. Um, because when I was in relationships with friends or meeting new people, I felt like I had to hide part of myself. I couldn't tell them a story about my family because I couldn't explain what was wrong with my dad because I thought if they know what's wrong with my dad, they're going to know that I'm gene positive, right? So, so eventually when I started saying, okay, this is what's wrong with my dad and this is what's going to happen to me one day, it was just very freeing and uh, really the greatest thing I've ever done. You touched on self-esteem as well. I had that as well. Like I had very low self-esteem as a child and like growing up as well. I was like a direct relationship to HD where I didn't feel worthy sometimes of even being alive. Yeah. You know, and then you process those emotions when you go to therapy and it's like, okay, like I deserve to be alive. You know, things like that. And like I cannot stress enough how important it is to get the support you need. Because when you're insulating yourself and like going through things on your by yourself, you, it messes with your head a little. You, you, do, you don't think you can rely on people and it shapes your entire world uh, outlook. Couldn't agree more. And I think what each of you kind of has done is, is a lot, right? It, I, I kind of touched on it when I spoke earlier, kind of that fight or flight mentality of, right, I can kind of try to, you know, push it away or, or get involved and, you know, not saying you have to get involved right away, but each of you are, are doing amazing things. And so, you know, for someone that's new to the community or is here and is like, I haven't been as involved, uh, any kind of tips uh, that you can share um, so that people don't feel like in order to get involved, they have to do research in HD or start a youth, you know, support uh, program in Brazil or write a book, you know, because those are big steps, right? But how do you, how do you get started? Uh, well, it's just small steps to get there because I had this grand idea that I wanted to write a book about my experiences because what I went through felt so important that I needed a book to share all of that. Like, I didn't feel that if I just wrote a blog, I could really encompass everything that I had gone through. But it was terrifying to even just sit down and journal any of my feelings. And I would just sit at my computer crying all night long, and I would lock the door and tell my husband not to come in. <laughs> and it would be after my daughter was in bed. So it, it actually took me four years of doing that before I was able to write my book. And then during that time, I started doing things like, OK, I'll start an Instagram account and just put one thing out there, or um, actually the very first thing I got published online was an article on the Mighty. And um, I remember I, I, I submitted it and it took nine months for them to accept it. And then nine months later, they're like, oh, we've accepted your story and it's published. I was like, oh, crap, <laughs> right? That's how I felt. And I said to my husband, should I put it on Facebook? He's like, of course you should put it on Facebook. And I'm like, but, but then everybody will know. Yeah, and he encouraged me, yes, put it on Facebook. It's already online. You might as well take that last step. But that was completely terrifying, and that was the first step I took of sort of coming out of the HD closet and being public with it. So it's not like I just went straight to writing a book. There's like all these little tiny steps along the way that led up to that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So for, for the first time when I started getting involved in the community, it was just something really, really simple. I just wrote an email to Maddie and you know, I asked, how can I help? I'm really desperate to help and you know, help other people as well. So he gave me this boring task of translating <laughs> the HDYO website into Urdu. I never did it. <laughs> oh, no. yeah, I never did it. I never got back to him about it. <laughs> and then a few years later, when I was like more mature, I started doing other things. So one of the things that, so <laughs> uh, yeah. So one of the things that I was uh, really passionate about at that time was improving access to genetic testing in my country. So I'm from Pakistan. When I was growing up, there was really no support for families and no access to genetic uh, testing as well in the country uh, I was in. 
so it was mainly uh, a sense of desperation in that sense as well. Like I really wanted to do something about it. And then I just started emailing people. Like I m emailed, I remember, 60 to 100 scientists to see if they would be interested in collaborating with this geneticist in Pakistan that I'd reached out to who was interested in seeing HD patients as well. So it started off that way. We set up a collaboration where patients could submit their uh, samples. Unfortunately, there was no genetic counseling involved because Pakistan, again, has very limited infrastructure. So patients had to be counseled by the neurologist who was seeing them. Um, and then we took the samples and sent them to our collaborating lab who was testing them for HD. So using that as a platform, I basically translated what they were doing in the collaborating lab and transferred that knowledge to our country and set up like local testing services so we could locally test within Pakistan without the need to send samples abroad. Um, and then so, sort of building capacity upon that as well, we launched like a genetic test, a genetic counseling uh, training program. So the geneticist I was working for, he got promoted and like became the head of his institute and he lost this genetic counseling testing program. So now the first wave of genetic counseling counselors in Pakistan is coming through. And now we're trying to, you know, have genetic counseling available for patients as well. So yeah, again, echoing, it's, it starts with really, really small steps and then it, you build it from there, start to get involved in communities you care about and sort of trying to make an impact, the impact you want to see or what you never had to give that to other people. Yeah. Um, I think if you want to get involved in the community, I think you can start by contact your local association or try and find someone with you comfortable with and I think you always kind of HDYO they are so helpful and so supportive and even um, sometimes not our languages are different but they always um, find a way to help and even using the translator <laughs> um, and I think that for me I'm also start sharing my thoughts, sharing my ideas with my, um, uh, my some people in Brazil for my local association. I, I write, also write a lot of emails asking for help. And um, I think it's, it's there is, we are here for help also. The, the ambassador's program uh, is so supportive and we we can help you if you can, if you just want to talk. I think it's the first step. We, we there are so many things, difficult things we struggling, and just find your way. There is no uh, one way to to get involved. It's, there are many ways to get involved. So find your way. Find something you'll be comfortable with and just start it and try, um, try experience and then, then we discover how you feel about it. And you can decide, I go on or I go back. It, it is, I, I think that's the most principal thing, the main thing you just know. We always stop or we, we can go on. It's your decision, it's always your decision. Can I just add, um, one of the things I've learned over the last year when working with the authors in the HD Heroes book is that every single person who wrote stories in that book had something that they went through that they felt was so important that they had to share it. And every single person's experience was unique to them. And they um, are making waves in the HD community in a way that feels important to them. So I think that um, based on your unique experiences and how you want to get involved, something will come up. And you might not even know what that is now or if you even want to do anything now. So again, the three of you are very involved in the community and, and with that being said, how do you balance your involvement in HD with just life outside of HD, you know, whether you do cooking or play sports or whatever the case here is when it comes to your hobbies. So how do you balance life and do you have trouble saying the, the big 
an O word. No. <laughs> Sometimes it could be very hard because you get so consumed about it because I just feel so passionate about helping people share their stories that I forget, oh, okay. Like, I have to pay attention to my regular life sometimes, too. Oh, I have to pay attention to my family. I have to pay attention to my other needs, right? Like, I can't just let HD be the only thing I do. Um, so we're a very sports-oriented family, and playing sports and being actively involved in things really takes our mind off stuff. Um, and very recently, I've started doing a lot of meditating, which um, is something I've always wanted to do but only have gotten into since um, covid because uh, there was a lot of stress around being at home and working from home, and I wasn't being the parent I wanted to be, so that's what made me start meditating, which is a really neat tool because you can really go someplace else in your mind. Um, so I found that to be really helpful. What's your favorite sport? Oh. <laughs> well, I'm a huge runner, N not recently, but uh, um, I want to really get back into it. But before I had my daughter, I used to run marathons, so I would like to start doing that again. Here to hear first, she's running a marathon. <laughs> we'll hold you to it now. Sure, sure. It's recorded. <laughs> yeah, so like I have a really, really hard time saying no, especially when it comes to HD work. Like I feel this all the time in my current uh, career, which is like scientific research. I often take on too much, and that impacts my health overall, where I'm trying to do too much at the same time, and you're trying to basically make an impact through scientific research. I'm better at it now. Um, I've recently taken up a lot of different hobbies, which I don't know if it's a good thing to have too much, too many hobbies. <laughs> but yeah, I try to, I try to like spread it out now, where I'm not too attached to my work, because previously my whole identity was revolving around my relationship with HD. But you know, at the end of the day, you're not just a family member or someone who has experienced HD. You're an individual who has his, who has different aspects to himself or herself. So I'm trying to approach that that way. I don't think I have all the answers right now, but I'm slowly getting there. Um, for me, I work at ABH, Brazilian Hunters Association, from Monday to Friday. So I'm in touch with HG all my, my hours and all the weeks. And I create a system to, um, in the weekend, I can hear anything about HE, <laughs> nothing. And I um, like to go to the gym. And I also like to meditate and some techniques some about mindfulness. It's very helpful because um, uh, just I work, and I'm also started some research about HG. So it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot in my mind. So I'm trying to find some moments. If can I never talk about it, then just be a normal life, <laughs> talk about other things. But it sometimes is difficult because HG it became in your life, and and it's so difficult to try find some other things when you so much involved, but I think it, it's important to back off and make another things, think ab about on another thing. So just, uh, just, just it, just it. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. So I, I try to distract myself by like not thinking about HD, by actually rock climbing. So rock climbing is like another puzzle to solve where I'm like thinking about the way I can move my body to reach the next hole or something like that. And also it's physical fitness, which is great because you need to be exercising too. It's also great for your mental health. Yeah. So before I ask more questions, just want to be mindful of time. Matt, come on. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just, uh, Matt and I have a, 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 love, a loving relationship. We've known each other for years. But uh, does anyone have... What? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Separating. <laughs> Does anyone uh, have any questions for our panelists? Uh, yes, and I'll repeat it if we can't hear you.
uh, I'm in the same boat. So like I was like you, doing a lot of like extracurricular activities all through undergrad. I didn't learn how to say no till literally, I would say three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> In my PhD program, I'm like two years deep into a PhD, and that's the first time I actually could say no to my supervisor that I don't think I have the capacity to do this right now, uh, but I'll think about it. <laughs> no, that's, the way, that's the way I phrased it. So my advice would be like, the, the thing that helped me was like, okay, you have to really prioritize yourself, because at the end of the day, even, in your, even if you're in graduate school, you're, you're in it for you, and you have to do what's best for you. You, you have to start to say no in that sense that if you can't take more things on, you're gonna be super busy, you're already at capacity, you have to also take care of yourself. Sure, maybe um, try time blocking. It's a technique for figuring out how much you can actually get done in a day. And then once you see how overbooked you are, <laughs> then you'll be like, oh no, I can't add anything else onto there. I would, I would suggest that. Um, always try to think when I say yes for something, for all the things, I'm also saying no for many things. So I always think that way. So if I say yes for this, what's the other things I have saying no? So it's so helpful for me. Okay, I don't need to do a lot of things, <laughs> just brief, <laughs> and stay back and think about this, the, the other things you want to do to e and the other things you need to not to do. <laughs> so I think it's helpful to think that way. Thank you for the question. We may have time for one more question. Well, unfortunately, I just, I really pushed and pushed and pushed myself, and we got that book out in 10 months, which now that I'm thinking about it was really quickly, um, and I, I didn't say no enough. Like, I kind of burnt myself out from that project, and at the same time, my dad was sick in, in hospital, and I had a lot of responsibilities that way. Um, when I was working with individual authors on their stories, some of them impacted me more than others, and I would need to take a couple of di days to digest that story, and I couldn't move on to the next story until, you know, I've, I really felt the impact of that and how it, how it impacted me. Um, other stories were a little bit easier because, you know, you connect with some people's stories more than others. Um, so I guess I would just say give yourself the time to process those emotions. Um, as you're going through it, and if it delays the project a little bit, that's not the end of the world if the project's out a month or two later. Yeah, I'm just going to shamelessly plug Meghna's documentary. She already has one. It's called Piano Fingers. Go watch it. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, we could probably sit here and talk for another couple hours because you, you all have some amazing advice and just passion for, for giving back to the community. So what I just want to say is thank you to the three of you for sharing, and I would love just one more round of applause for our amazing speakers. Yeah.